here in this community, it's com community of farmers, uh, still consider to Israel uh, quite a lot of farmers because farming in Israel is uh, going down, unfortunately, today. So there is quite a lot of people that uh, still manage to, to stay farmer here and I'm uh, also one of those people. Uh, I have two kids. Uh, my older son, his name is James and he's almost 19, I can't believe I'm saying it. And my younger daughter, her name is Jade, and she's almost 15, so I have two grown-up kids. It's because you are here because of a very famous story in the world. The Israeli, Palestinian, Israeli, Gaza conflict. And everybody who comes from different parts of the world heard about this conflict. They know that there is a conflict and they know quite a lot about it. But usually when, they ask, when I ask people, or oh, I get to, to talk to them, what they know about the conflict and most of the time they know quite a, quite a lot, they usually know about this side of the story, <coughs> which is the Palestinian side, the Gaza side's story. Now, I'm not making any list of their story. They have a story and their story should be heard and taught. But we have a story too. And uh, when I uh, want to explain my story to people, I usually find out that the, the people usually know nothing about what happens on this side of the border, the Israeli side. Now, when I want to tell my story, this is not in order to make any kind of an argument with the other side. This is not in order to win any kind of an argument. It's just to present my story. Because um, people who come here usually don't just come because they're curious. They usually come because they think that need to be solved, that it shouldn't be like this. And I believe that if people come and want to offer solutions, if they know half a story, at the most they can offer half a solution and half a solution will never solve anything. So I'm here to tell my story, just to give a more of a complete a, a, a story, a, a wider point of view. That's why we are here today in Moshav, much better than Kibbutz Netiva Asara, a, a very small community on the border with the Gaza Strip, actually the nearest community to, to the Gaza Strip. Nobody lives any closer to Gaza. And that means that everything that happens on the border, we are more affected. If, if things happen, it happens here more. So, so we feel that conflict every day of our life. Because we are here to talk about the Israeli-Gaza conflict, I uh, would like to mention something that I thought it's obvious, but then I found out that a lot of people don't know. Israel is considered to be the occupier of the Gaza Strip, right? This is what everybody knows. Israel occupies Gaza. And that means that most people assume that Israel at some point went into the Gaza Strip and took it over from the Palestinians. But the fact is that the Palestinians never controlled the Gaza Strip. Before the Israelis, I mean, there were many nations that controlled at some point the Gaza Strip. But before the Israelis, it was the Egyptians. And when Israel took over the Gaza Strip, uh, the Sinai Desert from the Egyptians, they also took over the Gaza Strip from them. And when Israel and Egypt negotiated the peace agreement, it was the first time, I think, in history that uh, countries argued about who's not going to have a piece of land. Because uh, Egypt, when they said, we want to have the Sinai Desert back, they said, we, but we refuse to take back the, Sinai, the, the Gaza Strip. The peace agreement uh, nearly fell down, nearly collapsed, because they, they, they couldn't agree who's going to keep the Gaza Strip. And in the end, Israel said, we're going to make this uh, sacrifice for peace. Uh, we'll keep the Gaza Strip. We'll uh, uh, take control over this piece of land, and the Egyptians are free from uh, uh, their uh, responsibility for the land that they uh, had for so long. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and people ask me, but why to move? You know, if you had so many options, why to go and live in such a problematic area? Why, why to go and live there from all the places? And the answer is that when we moved here in the early 80s, that wasn't a problematic area. It was just a place. And Gaza, then, for us, was just a city. I mean, we live here, which is here, and this is Gaza city. This is the nearest city for us. And I have memories as a child uh, from Gaza being just a city, and actually a nice city. Uh, uh, I remember going, doing the weekly shopping in Gaza, in the market. I remember you know, using the garage and the bank and the post office in Gaza. Every time uh, we wanted to grab some fast food, which is not McDonald's, you know, hummus, we went to eat some hummus in Gaza and coming back, which is not that obvious today. Uh, 
just a normal normal life. You see this road here? We will be next to this road in an hour. And it doesn't look like this in any kind of way. And this road, I used to go as a child, I used to take my bicycle, I used to go to the beach, which nobody can do today. So how did it all change from Gaza being just a city, just a place, a nice place, to what we have today? I was nine months pregnant when the first rocket was launched from Gaza. And uh, with my luck, it landed in my farm. So one day, we woke up in the morning, and actually it was an afternoon, but for the story, we woke up in the morning and out of the blue, without any warning, without any notice, a rocket from Gaza landed in our farm, in my farm, but it was our farm. And, you know, it's quite a dramatic event. And most people, you know, when they ask me, you know, how we felt about it, you know, a rocket came, I, I, you know, they assume we were crying or we were panicking or we were shocked or we were afraid. And, and I mean, that makes sense. But the fact is that we weren't. The reaction that we had for that very first rocket was laughing. You know, not living, laughing. Uh, because it's hard for me to pronounce the laughter that we had. <laughs> uh, and I want to show you why, because I just so happened to have a rocket here. And this is why we all laughed. Because we all have to admit this is a very, very funny and silly looking rocket. Uh, it looked like an eight years old did it in the garden. It's not the very first rocket, but it's one of the very first. So this is how they looked. It just crossed the border a little bit. It landed on the sand. It's a sandy soil, so it's landed on the sand like this made a very small explosion, made a very small hole on the ground, and it, it was popping out like this, looking at it like this, and we looked at this and we said, come on, are you being silly? I mean, look at this. And, and it, it looked funny. It looked funny, but it was a dramatic event. It was the first rocket. So everybody did what you are doing now. TV came, journalists came, newspaper came, and they all took photos of that very ridiculous rocket. It was front pages everywhere in the world. And it didn't look to anyone like a really big problem. And if it's not a big problem, it's not a problem, and then you don't have to fix it. And then it was, you know, but they, they didn't mention it. Now the next morning, the next day, there was another rocket, similar to this. Now, when something happened day after day, it's not a breaking headline anymore, it's just news. So they mentioned it. It wasn't breaking headlines, it wasn't front page anymore, but they did mention it. And it, it but in the mind of everyone, that was the rocket. The third day, when we had the third rocket, you know, it was mentioned somewhere, but, and still everybody remembered that ridiculous, silly looking uh, rocket. And the fourth day, there was also a very important football match or something like this. Who can talk about rockets? And uh, uh, they didn't mention it. And from that day on, we had rockets every single day. But nobody talked about it. From time to time, they mentioned it. In Israel, I'm not even talking about the international news. They didn't even mention it. And our life turned from being nice, normal, regular life into living hell. The rockets definitely didn't stay like this. They got better, they got bigger, they got uh, uh, deadly, they became factory made weapons. But in the mind of everyone, David and Goliath, the small rockets against nothing. It's th that's what it stayed. That's not how it is today. Uh, so Israel said, okay, you know, there are rockets. We can't deny rockets are coming. We don't think it's a big issue, but still it's rockets. They can still cause damage if, you, if they land next to you and they got bigger and better with time. So it's mean uh, we need to be uh, more careful about it. What can we do? Let's provide people with bomb sh shelters. I mean, how do you fight rockets? You need to be in a bomb shelter in order to be safe. So one day we woke up and the entire community changed its face every house and every public building and every street corner were added with bomb shelters. If you want to ask me how many bomb shelters, I mean, we sit now in a bomb shelter. By the way, this is the kids' bomb shelter. This is where kids have activity. We have the playground above us. In the past, we used to have a very big and nice 
playground and they uh, uh, took it down because they uh, uh, assumed uh, that people, uh, kids playing in a big playground is unsafe. So it's better kids will have a bomb shelter to play. So there, there is now a small one that can allow people the time to maybe escape. Our obligation as people who live here is to know at any single moment where is the nearest bomb shelter? Because this is the most important question that we have. Where is the nearest bomb shelter? This is the question or the answer that will save your life. How far, how long do you have to find shelter? If you live, for example, in Tel Aviv, you have about 1 minute and 45 seconds from the time you hear the alarm until the time you need to be in a shelter. If you live in Jerusalem, you have about 2 minutes. If you live in Ashdod, you have about 45 seconds. If you live in Ashkelon, you have about 30 seconds. And the first uh, uh, circle around the Gaza Strip, officially by the, uh, this map, have 15 seconds. 15 seconds from the time you hear the alarm until the time you need to be in a shelter. But we saw that the closer you are, the less time you have, right? And I did mention that we are the closest community to the Gaza Strip. Nobody lives any closer. So it means the 15 seconds, the official 15 seconds, it's not the time that we have. It's the time that people usually have when they live around Gaza. When you live the closest, you have less time. How much time? In reality, about three or four seconds. Three or four seconds from the time we hear the alarm until we need to be in a shelter. So why did we have eight bomb shelters from the bus to here? Because we have three or four seconds to be in a shelter. This is why the entire community is full with shelters. And our life became dependent on being next to a shelter and, and, uh, and hearing the alarm. Now when all this started, when Israel started providing this uh, uh, alarm system, in the beginning it was quite new and it was, you know, it's a radio system. I don't know exactly how it works, but once it's recognized that a, a rocket is being launched, it, uh, automatically starts the speakers. But the first 40, almost 14 years, we had about five rockets a day. And not only we had five rockets a day, but the kibbutzes here had about five rockets a day, and the city of Sderot had about five rockets a day, and the kibbutzes here had about five ro rockets a day. So it was only five rockets a day that I can tell you it's a normal number. Why is it a non normal number? Because we had rockets about five a day for almost 14 years, and Israel did nothing about it. So I learned from my government that, four, uh, that five rockets a day is normal and we can all live with this peacefully, except the bus, but, but that was the number. But our problem was that we had five rockets a day being launched toward our uh, community, but it was one alarm system, one radio system. So we only had five rockets a day with 20 alarms. Now, we lived our life, supposed to have normal life, supposed to go to school, supposed to study, supposed to go to work, supposed to have an everyday life. And 20 times a day, in an average, our day was broken by an alarm telling us a rocket might be coming, might be coming our way. And we have three or four seconds to run and find shelter because you don't know if it's coming this time or not. So 20 times a day, every single day, not for a day, not for a week, not for a month, but for almost 14 years, that we lived our life walking and thinking about rockets. Walking and asking, where is the nearest shelter? Where is the nearest shelter now? We had kids that used to come to my house, for example, visiting my son for the first time. And they come and they say, you know, they all shy and say, hi, where is your bomb shelter? Because they know at the age of nothing that knowing where is the nearest bomb shelter is the most important thing. So they don't care about where is the playroom, where is the toilet. They have time together. They have no time to wonder where to go. So kids from the age of nothing were thinking about bomb shelter and be safe from a bomb shelter. And those kids, you know, I send my son. I, I live very near the shop. That, you know, I don't know if you saw me buying my uh, coat there. Very near. I used to say, you know, he's eight, nine years old, normal age to send him to bring some milk from the shop. And tell him, ah, oh, don't go and get some milk, get some bread on the way, and don't forget 
to watch yourself from bomb shelters, uh, from, sorry, from rockets. Don't forget where is the bomb shelters on the way. Every single day, it's right here. So my point is that yes, the rockets became bigger, they became better, they became deadlier, but it doesn't really matter. Because before anything else, this rocket is a psychological weapon. And it's a very, very effective weapon and it doesn't matter how, how it looks. And the uh, organization that shoots it, if I can call it that way, Hamas, a terror organization, what they organize is terrorism. And they're doing exactly that. They're trying not necessarily to kill people. They're not a killing organization. They are not a mass murderers organization, they are a terror organization and they are trying to do exactly that, to terrorize people. And they understood it from day one, which Israel failed to understand. I think until today, if I can allow to criticize Israel as well on the way, which I'm allowed. <laughs> Yet, still. So. And, you know, people ask me, you know, what is the uh, statistic of this weapon? How, how many percentage of people got hurt from rockets? Do you want to guess how many people? Got hurt from a rocket? I'll help you. 100%. Everybody got hurt. It's a psychological weapon. So it's meaning it doesn't matter where the weapon lands. It can land in an open space, and because it's a statistic weapon, it's a more chance to land in an open space. It can land on a greenhouse, but it's a less chance. It's a less chance to hit a house, and it's a less chance to hit a, uh, a person. So the chance to actually get somebody hurt, especially that they are in a bomb shelter, is slim. It doesn't mean they are not trying, but it's slim. But imagine what happened to people who just had an alarm, and they just ran into a bomb shelter. And in this time, they were thinking about saving this, themselves, and they were thinking about the kids. Where are my kids? Are my kids okay? Where is my parents? Where is my partner? Where are my dogs? They're thinking about the, the fear, of, this fear of life, they realized that this time everything okay, everybody are, are uh, safe, either the rocket landed near or far or they didn't hear it at all, and they come out from the bomb shelter and they're supposed to continue their everyday life like nothing happened. Until the next time, and the next time will come, a minute away, 10 minutes away, an hour away, but it will come for 14 years. Can you imagine what this happened to people? Uh, a schedule, but imagine half past seven in the morning, very, very popular uh, hour for the rockets uh, in the first 14 years. Oh, Why? Yeah. Half past seven in the morning. Why? Because if you shoot one ridiculous homemade uh, looking rocket, it doesn't matter where it fails and where it lands and when it hits. You still manage to put the entire community's life into a complete stop. School bus ca uh, uh, can't come because you can't uh, uh, take, send the bus to pick up the kids when they have uh, rockets. You can't go to work, you have to calm your kids down. You started your day fearing from rockets. And then you're supposed to continue like nothing happened. Now, uh, uh, you know, the, the kids that, that uh, uh, just went out and they had to wait to the bus, where they do it? In a bomb shelter bus stop, the only safe place. And when they go to school, uh, you know, the, the, the rockets uh, uh, can be everywhere. How can you take responsibility for a, a class of 30 kids who sit and during school hours, they might have a few alarms. Now, you know, let's, you know what, let's now give the class the benefit of a full 15 seconds. Imagine 30 kids sit in a class and while they're trying to study math, there is an alarm and the entire class have to get up and jump from their chair and run to the bomb, the school bomb shelter within 15 seconds with the rest of the school. Is that possible? Not possible. So what Israel did, they rebuilt all this region, preschools, nurseries, uh, high school, universities, completely as bomb shelters. So when kids can sit in their class and they have an alarm, they don't need to run anywhere. They are already safe in a bomb shelter. So when they go to bring the milk, they need to think about the bomb shelter. When they sit in the class, they know they're in a bomb shelter. But we did say that rockets don't have a schedule. What happens if the rockets land at 2 o'clock in the morning? Now imagine you have two, three or four kids and, and uh, uh, you sleep in your bed. It's 2 o'clock in the morning. All of a sudden there is an alarm. And you have three or four seconds to wake up, realize what is happening, jump from your own bed, go and grab all your kids and run with them to the bomb shelter within three or four seconds. Is that possible? 
It's not possible. So what do you do when you, I'm as a mother, when I go to bed, I want to know that my kids, at least my kids are safe. What do I do? I put them in the bomb shelter. It's the only safe place when you live next to Gaza. And this is how you find kids that live next to Gaza, but inside the international borders of Israel, in a territory that is not under dispute, that it's a part of any future Israel, that been sleeping every night in a bomb shelter for the last 19 years. But nobody speaks about it. Nobody talks about it. It's not happening. And when they go out, they go to study in a bomb shelter. And when they want to go and play, they play in a bomb shelter. And that is our reality. And that's what is happening. And we can't explain it. And it's very, very frustrating. How will I explain it to, to a two years old, to a three years old? How do you explain the Israeli Palestinian conflict to a child? Someone is shooting at you, you don't really understand what is going on. What's going on in kids' mind? Understanding life. You know, when, when my first son, he was just a baby, I was, uh, uh, you know, I was doing something, he was next to me, he wasn't going anywhere because he couldn't. Uh, I was, uh, uh, you know, let's say doing dishes. And all of a sudden, I hear an alarm. I go, I come, I grab my son, I protect him, and I run to the bomb shelter. He's three months old, he's six months old, he's nine months old. One day I'm doing the dishes, uh, there is an alarm, I'm turning to grab my child, he's not there. He's in the bomb shelter. Why would a one-year-old run to a bomb shelter? Why the, what does he understand? What does he know about life? What does he grow to be? You know, I, I always said that my biggest challenge is a mother is not to keep my kids safe. It's not a challenge. Because if you lock them in the bomb shelter, they are safe. How do you keep them mentally safe? How do you teach them this is not life? How do you give them hope? I mean, if I come today and do the most normal thing in the world, and I'll say to my kids what my parents told me, come on kids, let's go to the new city and have some hummus. That thing, I lost my mind completely. For them, this is the last place they want to be the last place they want to be. I mean, this is hell for them. <clears throat> I didn't grow up having these memories, but this is the memories my kids growing up. And my son, 19, is, is an adult already. He don't know other life. And you know what? Kids on the other side of the border, they don't know other life too. And I think this is really our last chance to tell them there is another option, that you can go and have some homes in Gaza and come back. And that is normal, not what is happening today. So we never lost hope, and I didn't lose hope until today, but there was one point during these years that uh, hope was quite great, let's call it. Do you know what happened here in this region in 12th of August 2005? Something major happened here. Do you know what it was? Yes. What it was? Mm, uh, what's the word? Disengagement of the disengagement. The disengagement was the time that Israel said, okay, we are being fired at by thousands of rockets. It's a day, it's a daily thing. We can't stop it because the meaning of stopping the rockets is a deadly meaning. Not for us. Okay? Not for us. To stop the rockets, it it, 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 it means you need to have a major a, a, a army operation which will cost the life of many people, which are not us. And anyway, we never wanted this place too much. And the Palestinians say they want to control the Gaza Strip. The international community supports it because they never, uh, um, I miss a word, they never said to Hamas, don't shoot rockets, it's wrong. They always said, well, you know, they're fighting for their uh, uh, freedom. And Israel then, said, okay, you know what? We are living in the Gaza Strip, it's all yours. Take it, make it a wonderful place, like it should be. And Israel left, and they left in a day. Now, in, in the Gaza Strip, Israel used to live, okay? There were uh, villages of Israelis inside the Gaza Strip. When you give back, you can't, it means that your people, this is the reality where we can't stay there. It means they have to go. Now, in this disengagement, not like the peace agreement between Israel and Egypt, people left much, left much, 
sorry, left much less willingly. Uh, uh, and it was a traumatic day for, for Israel. Doesn't matter if you supported the act or didn't, to see soldiers and policemen dragging people, Israelis, from their homes for the last time. They didn't want to go and they actually dragged them, they carried them out of, from their homes and said, we have nothing to do anymore with the Gaza Strip. Now it's belong for the Palestinian. Now they can be in control in everything that is happening. Now, most of the Israeli villages were located here, but there are also three Israeli villages in the north of the Gaza Strip. You see this road here? This is the international border. This red roofs here, it's an Israeli village that used to be uh, in the Gaza Strip until 2005. This is one, this is the second, and this is the third. And there were also people were pulled out, the ones that didn't live before, and it was destroyed. And this is how it looks today. The red roofs became this. And I don't know if, uh, if it's understood from the map, but this is very close. We were very close to each other, just one road separated. Yes. We were walking to each other. Uh, and this is how it looks today. And if I was hoping, I didn't believe, but I was hoping that this disengagement will stop the nightmare me and my kids were living in. Not only that I was wrong, I was very wrong. Because if that before was an Israeli village, now Hamas, the terror organization who was shooting all this, took over this place. And if before they were shooting rockets from quite far, now it is just next to us, just near us. And that changed our life, uh, not for the good, but for the bad. Because if before we were in the range of rockets, now we became in the range of mortars as well. Now mortars are a completely different story. Why is it a different story? Because it's a very small weapon, factory-made weapon. Usually it doesn't even start the alarm, and you don't have three or four seconds. Because if there is an alarm, it lands with the alarm, or it doesn't even start the alarm. And all of a sudden, you live in a battlefield that you, if before three or four seconds looked like a, a, a little time, now it's looked like a lot of time. You have no time. And you need to live with the mortars in your head, prepared to save your life 24-7. So I just want to mention a, a mortars for a little bit because I, I want to talk also about solutions. In the end of, yeah. No, no. I was asking, was there fence over here at that time? Fence? There was no fence. Oh, no, no, no. oh when, when, when this, this engagement happened? No fence. This, this map is from 2002, there was nothing. Right. Nothing happened. Yeah. When did this engagement took place? In the beginning, there was nothing. It was, you know, they took out the houses, but they didn't build anything. Yeah. Uh, but, and then Hamas came here, and it was, li this is literally next to each other. People of this mushaf were sitting in the nights, watching and being prepared in case Hamas will come. Obviously the army was there as well, but not only the army. And then quickly they built a, a, a wall. Now, when people come here and they see the wall, they assume Gaza is surrounded by a wall. But the wall starts here and ends here. That's it. And the rest of Gaza now is surrounded by a fence, a simple fence. There are three places that they actually have a wall, uh, next to the three closest Israeli communities to the Gaza Strip. One is us, Nehiva Asara, that have a small wall here. One is next to Nachalos, that have a small wall here. And one is next to Kerem Shalom, that have a small wall here. The rest is just a simple fence that was, wasn't there before. Wasn't there before. Uh, now, Hamas, instead of saying, look, we got rid of the Israelis, we got rid of the Jews, let's make this place to a nice place. They decided that they are not uh, uh, full and they want to continue. And they came here and they started with the mortars and with other things that they did, like, for example, uh, digging tunnels. I mean, you, you've been visiting Israel for a few days now, right? Yeah. Have you been to Tel Aviv? No? No. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Did anyone use the underground in Tel Aviv? No. no. You know why? Because there is none. <laughs> <laughs> in, 70, in 70 some years, Israel didn't manage yet to do the uh, basic, 
to, to, to the, its main cities, and that's built an underground system. Hamas, however, in the few years he was in power, managed to build an amazing underground tunnel that is built all over under Gaza and into have lines into Israel. Now people tell me, you know, but because Gaza is closed and there is walls and fences, there is no food coming into Gaza, so they built, this is what I heard from previous groups, they built those tunnels in order to smuggle food into Gaza, which is not the case. I'm going back to your question about Egypt. Israel known uh, now from being the occupier of Gaza to the one who closed Gaza in, okay? Uh, you asked why Egypt didn't want to have anything to do. And I want to ask, you know, this is the border between Israel and the Gaza Strip, right? Do you know what this is? This is the border with Egypt. Most people I meet don't know, don't know that Gaza has a border with, uh, with Egypt. Now, this border, is it open? Is anything come in, people, goods, medication, food, comes in, closed completely. Now, why Egypt, a neighbor Arab Muslim country, decided to close and seal the border completely with their neighbors? Why, why is it not free for all? Why they decided we have nothing to do with this case and never been asked and judged for it? Because they want nothing to do with them. They want, I don't know why, ask them, but they want nothing to do with them. And the border is closed completely, no food, no medication, only weapons from underground. Now, yes, the uh, uh, people from Gaza also build tunnels that smuggle food, but only on this border. On that border, they built uh, uh, dozens of tunnels that are not supposed to bring any food into Gaza. They're supposed to bring troops into Israeli communities on the border. Now, Israel in 70-something years, an high-tech nation, let's call it, never managed to build an underground system. And here we have dozens of tunnels, real tunnels, not a small hole someone is crawling through. You know, for example, the tunnel they found here in my community, we are very proud of our tunnel, was wide enough for a car to drive through. It said electricity, it said ventilation, it was, uh, it was 35 meter deep. Why is 35 meter deep? Why so deep? Because it's deeper than what anyone can find. You can't find a tunnel that is so deep. Imagine the amount of money that was put into these tunnels. Imagine the amount of uh, labor that was put in into these tunnels. Imagine the amount of passion that was put in, in this tunnel, not in order to rebuild Gaza, not in preparing schools and uh, uh, luxury apartments, building tunnels in order to attack me and my kids. And that was what discovered in 2014 in Protective Edge. Now Israel knew that they are building tunnels, they didn't know how, ma how many and how big this project was. It was an enormous, enormous project. And then we thought, if, if we thought the real danger is coming from above, we understood that the real danger is coming from uh, underneath. That was scary days until today. To sit in your home and to know that someone is digging a huge tunnel in order to bring many, many people to attack you, to, 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 to destroy you. Now, I want to remind again, this is when you dig a tunnel, you are not crossing a... a, a just a line that is a symbolic. You're crossing an international border. Now, I see people from time to time demonstrating on the streets in New York, in London, in Berlin. I never saw in Finland, but it's only because I wasn't looking. And they all hold in, they all hold in signs, free Gaza, right? Free Gaza. And I want to ask you, free Gaza from what? What Hamas is telling his own people we are fighting Israel, is not fighting Israel to free Gaza, Gaza is free. Make it the, the place you want. When Hamas attacks us, he's not doing it to free Gaza, he's doing it to free Israel. Uh, sometimes they, they found them, but they, you know, they, they make the tunnel, they make a way out, they keep it closed, and when they want to use it, they use it. And they did use it a few times, most of them they didn't use, because Israel went in protective edge war into Gaza, found all the entrance of the tunnel and blew up most of them, the one that they found. 
So they managed to use a few tunnels, but not all of them. They were, luckily, the one, the tunnel that they found here coming into our community was discovered before the, 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 the way out was prepared. They only had to push it out. And Israel could know. They knew where they, actually Israel knew about this tunnel from before because when you dig such a huge tunnel, you know, you have all this sand to take out. They saw a greenhouse on the other side. On this side, which is the, now there are greenhouses here, you know, like this one, for example. They saw trucks of sand taking it out. You know, Israel is looking what is happening. So they knew they are digging a tunnel from here, but they didn't know where to. So once protective edge war started, they went in through this tunnel and they found that it's coming out here. And it was ready. Another day, I mean, protective edge war started because they knew they are going to use the tunnels in September. They knew. So they st the war started in July. But still in the eyes of the international community, we came into Gaza, and, you know, and it was, my life was on the edge here, you know? I do expect my army to protect me. And I think the Palestinians should expect their own people to protect them. And I want to go back just five minutes to what I started to say about living on, on, on the, uh, under rockets, uh, under mortars, sorry. Because it does leave me to talk about solution and it's touch what I'm saying now. How can you protect yourself from a mortar being launched just a few meters from you that you have uh, uh, no alarm? And you want to be safe because mortars are much more deadly than a uh, rocket. Why is that? Never mind it's a factory made rocket. Uh, even though it's, it's a small rocket, it's full of shrapnels, you know, small uh, metal uh, um, Walls. And you don't need to be next to a mortar in order to get hurt because the uh, shrapnel fly uh, uh, to hundreds of meters away. So you don't need to be next to one. This is why they are more dangerous, more deadly. And from the people that we did lose in our community, we lost three lives. 100% of the people are affected, but three lives were lost, two to mortars and one to a uh, rocket. So if I talk about numbers, I talk about thousands, thousands of rockets that were launched towards our community that landed either next to houses, farms, or open spaces. Uh, if you want to talk about uh, real numbers, the number that had real rockets that landed really in our, our area, until 2014, we had about 2,000 rockets. Uh, in 14 years, it's only year. Alarms were so many more, but real rockets that landed on houses, greenhouses, or open spaces were about 2,000. During the two months, of protective edge, we had 2,000 rockets. What we had in 14 years, we had in two months. Um, and many lucks, many, many, many uh, uh, miracles that happened during these two months, uh, because 2,000 rockets in two months, that's like an average of a rocket every few minutes. It was a complete nightmare. And since then, for the f after protective edge, we had a few uh, good, about two or three years of quite a quiet time, and now we have many more rockets, but it doesn't come on a daily basis, it's coming periods. Every week or two or three, all of a sudden you have a few hundreds. For example, only two days ago, we had 101 rockets that we fired. Okay, so it's not five a day, it's 101. I can ask myself, you know, if my army, my Israeli defense force, see someone uh, 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 going to shoot at me, should I not expect them to stop them before they shoot? I mean, if, if, if you live in, in Finland and, and um, I don't know, Russia, Russia. Is, is preparing <laughs> weapon to shoot into a, to communities in Finland, would you not expect the Finnish government to stop them, especially if they see them preparing them? What, I, I, you want to get the weapon and say, well, that's it? So, yes, I can have this expectation for my army to destroy the weapon before it's being fired. But there is, there is a moral answer. What do I feel? What do I feel if I know that this weapon is located in a roof of a school? Do I want my army to destroy this weapon? If I know this weapon is located in a roof of a hospital or a clinic or a UN facility, do I want this weapon to, dis to be destroyed? Not really. Not really, because uh, I do have the bomb shelter, and I do have the time to get there, and my army do have the time to let me know 
So if you are an army and you need to protect your own citizens or stop the weapon that is, uh, 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 is against your citizens, are you going to shoot at the school? So there is a moral answer here, and Israel is being ju judged often for that choice that they are making, right? And for the hundreds of times that I used to get an SMS, you didn't know about the moral decision. Would you know about it if Israel will destroy the school with a weapon above it? Definitely. So Israel is being judged for the decision they make, right? Is Hamas being judged for the, de the, the decision they make? Is Hamas being judged for putting the, that weapon on the roof of a school and every time they shoot it from above a school towards me and my kids? Does anyone even talk about it? Is that become an issue? Never. Never. You know, we are very proud that we feel, I'm not that proud of you. You know, we feel here the effect of the life with Gaza. We have more rockets than other places. We have bigger tunnel. When we have today the kites and the balloons that come, they landed in our field, they're burning my farm. We feel that life. But there's only one place, only one place that feels it more. Do you know what it is? It's Kerem Shalom cross, uh, uh, cross border. How did you say? Border crossing. Border crossing, yeah. I lost the word. Border crossing. Kerem Shalom, there's three uh, border crossing uh, between Israel and Gaza. The one from Egypt completely sealed, okay? In Israel, there are three. One is here, it's called Erez Crossing, and it's for people only. Journalists, people who come to work, sick people who need hospital, hospital care, it's open for people. There is another one in Parni Crossing, but it's usually closed. And there is the main one in Kerem Shalom, right here in the south of the Gaza Strip. This is where, this is the uh, uh, root of everything into Gaza. Food, medication, fertilizer, helium gas for the balloons that they are sending. Everything is coming from this uh, uh, checkpoint, for a crossing. Everything, all the food, everything that Gaza need comes from there. Yes, obviously Israel wants to check that they are not sending weapons into Gaza. So they make sure it's only food, it's only medication, it's only what Gaza need to uh, uh, um, have a, a life there, okay? This is also the most attacked place by Hamas uh, 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 in Israel. Now Hamas, I don't know if you know, he was elected to be the official leaders of the Palestinians. In 2006, one year after the disengagement, they had an election in Gaza. Very, very de de uh, democratic election. It was so democratic that they didn't bother to have another one since. <laughs> I mean, look at Israel, it's such a democratic country, we have election every three months. I mean, you know, but they, 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 their, their campaign was that, well, that good that they didn't bother to ask their own people again, do you choose us to lead you? But still in the eyes of the international community, Hamas is the official leader of the Palestinian people. It means he takes care of his own people, right? This is why he's not building tunnels into attack Israel, he's building schools and hospitals. And this is why every time he wants to change, every time it's a little quiet for him in this PR issue, he's doing something. For example, he's bombing the trucks that be, brings food into Gaza. Hamas, the official leader of the Palestinian people, attack the place where brings food. Now, the place is being attacked. What do you do? You continue. You close it until it stops. They had rockets, they had suicide bombers, they had whatever you want there. And then you can't bring food. And then you have... It's PR. Then you have heartbreaking, and I'm not being cynical, heartbreaking photos of starving people in Gaza. They have nothing. Who's to blame? Israel across the checkpoint. Anyone speaks about the rockets? Anyone speaks about the, the suicide bomber in the checkpoint? Being sent by Hamas, not just a small organization, the official leader. In what world is that making sense? Is to say that I have hope. You can't live here without, if you have despair, you have nothing. 
So I am hope and I believe if it was normal in the past, it can be normal in, in, the, in the future. And I believe in people and I believe that common sense must win eventually. It, it might take time, but it will win. And the thing that keeps me hopeful the most is to know that my neighbors, the Palestinian, suffer from the same problem that I have. They, have, they don't have a different problem than me. I know, and I just want to say it, you know, I'm here speaking to you just to put things clear. Uh, I'm not supportive of the Israeli government for the last 20 years. I, I left Winber, I belong to the opposition. I think Israel should uh, have done and should do things differently uh, uh, today and in the future. I, I, I'm not an Israeli spokesman, okay? But I don't think Israel is the uh, 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 problem of the Palestinian people. I think Hamas is. Also, Israel is not my problem. <laughs> Hamas is. It's mean me and my neighbors, the Palestinian, the everyday people, have the same problem. It's mean we have the same solution. It, we have the same solution. Hamas is a terror organization and is using terrorizing people in order to gain what he wants. What does Hamas want? Can anyone understand? Can anyone understand terrorism? Does he want to make the life of the Palestinian better? He says so, but he's not doing anything to do that. He's using the misery of the Palestinian people to be a bigger organization, to be a richer, stronger organization. If they have better life, Hamas will be weaker, and they don't want it. Did Hamas ever ask truly the Palestinian people, do you want us to represent you? Never. Can anyone stand in Gaza and say, Ham I, I can say, I <coughs> can't bear the sight of the Likud party and Bibi is head and I wish he be replaced. Hey, I'm still alive. Can anyone stand in Gaza and say, we want Hamas to be replaced and live to see another day? The answer is no. So when I speak here, this is what I feel, when I speak here on behalf of my kids, I speak on their, behalf of their kids. Most people that come here presume that if you are pro-Israel, you must be against Palestinian. If you are pro-Palestinian, you must be against Israelis, and I think this is wrong. I'm a pro-Palestinian. I want the life of the Palestinian people to be better life. They deserve to have better life, and on the way, it will make my life better. Good neighbors, happy neighbors, makes your life better. And when I really with my uh, left winger eyes, watching what is happening here, I say, well, I see one problem. Hamas, a terror organization, is trying to make their life, and my life, into a living hell. And yet, when you meet the international community, you want to solve this, they say Hamas is representing these people. They're only trying to help them by putting weapons on the roof of a school by avoiding food and medication coming into Gaza. If Egypt thought Hamas had any good interest, that border would have been opened. And the people of Gaza would not be prisoners on their own land. The reason they are prisoners of their own land is because they have a terror organization that only want to export is death and misery to the people that live around them. And this is why this border is closed, and this is why this border is closed. Not completely. People still come to work, people still come to get medication, but it's quiet. They can't, any, nobody wants to admit, not Israel and not Hamas, that they have also uh, steps of normality. Nobody wants to say, we speak with the Arab. But there is no other solution, so they do it. But instead of saying it loud and clear, this is the time to bring this border to be open like it was before, they do it. Quietly, let's not admit that we are doing it. So, just to uh, finish in a hopeful way, I lived here as a child, knowing that Gaza was a normal, nice place. My kids don't know it, but I have a hope that they will find out. Because if it was in the past, it will be in the future. It just might take a little bit of time. Only one thing we need to do. We all need to accept and agree what is the problem and change it. If we don't agree what is the problem, everybody blame the problem to be in a different place, we have a problem to accept it. I want to say two last things. There is a very, very easy way to stop rockets. One, we mentioned it's difficult, it's the military way to go inside. Many people will lose their life. 
soldiers and civilians on the other side. That's the difficult way. You know what is the easy way to stop rockets? Not to shoot them. That's the easiest way to stop rockets. Not to shoot them. But somebody has to make this choice. Another thing that we need to do, free Gaza, right? This is a border. This is the international border. The entire world expect, ex, uh, uh, accept it as a border. Israel is used to live there. Israel pulled them out physically, saying we accept the international border as the international border. So what we have to do is to wait for Hamas, the, internet, the official leader of the Palestinian people, to say the same thing. We accept the border and let's just all move on in our life. So thank you very much for listening. <laughs>